Hi, and welcome to Quarantine Cocktails. Uh, today we're talking about the, another classic cocktail, the daiquiri, uh, and we'll be uh, doing a demo and, and teaching you all about it. So some uh, quick history about the daiquiri itself. Um, like Chad said, it is a classic cocktail. It typically consists of a four to two to one ratio of white rum, lime juice, and sugar. Um, the origin of the actual word daiquiri is from an, uh, an indigenous group of people uh, native to the Caribbean, uh, the Taino uh, people. Um, and they were likely the first New World people that uh, Columbus actually encountered. So that's kind of an interesting um, fact there. Um, the cocktail itself, um, it was rumored to be invented in around 1900 in Cuba by a man uh, named Jennings Cox. He was an American uh, mining engineer who was in Cuba during the Spanish-American uh, War. And so there's a, a tale around uh, a bunch of miners going to uh, the Venus bar at 8 a.m. in the morning every day and downing about three or four of these cocktails before they went to work in the mines every day. So, you know, they were... <laughs> Working hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we think that after they've, they've had this ritual going for, uh, for you know, X amount of time, they eventually thought about naming the cocktail and they named it after the small village and the iron mine uh, that have the same name and that is Daiquiri. So that is actually the name of a small village and uh, a mine back then that they were working in. Um, around 1909, the cocktail uh, was brought to the United States by a US uh, Navy medical officer. Um, he apparently uh, had acquired the taste of, of rum uh, in his time and also uh, used citrus, obviously, to treat scurvy and things like that. So he took the cocktail to the Army and Navy Club in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, there's also a bit about uh, yeah, World well, War II. Well, the cocktail gained in popularity from there uh, and spread throughout the U.S. and also within Cuba. Um, the uh, There was a a uh, place called the Floridita, a bar and restaurant in Havana uh, that perfected the making of the daiquiri with uh, blending it with ice uh, and basically serving the frozen daiquiri. Uh, and that was in the early 30s. Uh, Ernest Hemingway discovered this bar when he was living nearby uh, and frequented the bar. Um, he is uh, said to have tasted the daiquiri and decided that he wanted double the rum and none of the sugar. Uh, and so he had a very strongly rum uh, influenced uh, daiquiri with no sugar. Uh, and uh, that became known as the Papa Doble uh, or the, the, the double Papa for, uh, for Hemingway's nickname. Um, and it said that he didn't take the sugar because he was a diabetic. So, you know. Um, that that there is actually a Hemingway daiquiri that was made at the Floridita uh, in honor of Hemingway, but I don't believe that he actually drank that. Um, that one uses uh, some grapefruit juice uh, and also uh, replaces the sugar with maraschino liqueur uh, to give some sweetness. Um, uh, but again, it's uh, named in honor of him, not the actual daiquiri that he would drink. So if you look up the Hemingway daiquiri, that's usually the recipe that you'll see. Um, after uh, the, so the drink gained in popularity, uh, rum uh, increased in popularity during World War II uh, and uh, because other liquor, liquor was harder to obtain, uh, but uh, because of the good neighbor policy, uh, rum was easier to import in the US. Um, so much so that by 1948, when uh, the uh, David uh, Embray released his book, How to Mix uh, Cocktails, um, he uh, included it as one of his six basic classic drinks, um, along with the martini, the Manhattan, uh, the, um, sidecar. the sidecar, 
Uh, you might recognize some of these. Um, and the Jack Rose. Um, I think I missed one there, but uh, we've covered most of these, all, all of these cocktails except for the, the Jack Rose, uh, which I'm not sure we'll ever we'll do. It's not very popular, um, but uh, it, in, in any case, uh, Embry uh, was a tax attorney uh, in Manhattan, uh, and uh, his book became very popular because of uh, his you know, witty and opinionated uh, uh, way of writing this about his cocktails. Um, uh, he actually was pretty influential. Uh, he, you know, divided the cocktails between aromatic, which was largely like spirit forward, uh, like the martini uh, or the Manhattan, uh, and the sour, um, with, you know, which the daiquiri falls into the sour category. Uh, he was not a big fan of sugar. Uh, he, he wanted the drinks quite spirit heavy and, uh, and tart. Uh, and so his proportions for his sours was always uh, eight to two to one, uh, spirit to citrus to sugar. Um, uh, and uh, so there are many, so that was Embry, uh, the world's uh, most interesting tax lawyer. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the uh, there have been sort of many variations uh, of the daiquiri since it you know at, in the 50s when uh, people became somewhat enamored with you know tropical fruit flavor exotic travel uh, the you know the daiquiri went on this dark dark direction of being loaded with fruit and loaded with sugar which Embry certainly would not have have approved of um, uh, so. Uh, since then, the daiquiri, though, has had a bit of a resurgence uh, about, uh, you know, has had a bit of a resurgence to its more original roots um, as a uh, as a fairly, you know, kind of light, refreshing uh, presentation. Um, and so, you know, with white rum, uh, the tart, the tartness of the of the lime and then balanced with the with the sugar, uh, either, you know, some people put in uh, you know, kind of granulated sugar uh, or use simple syrup. So this is the classic daiquiri recipe uh, that, you know, certainly if you're working with white rum, you might try this version or you might try dialing down uh, the lime a little bit and go closer to Embry's formulation and see what, uh, see what you like. And these are all non-blended, non-frozen. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, today we, the the version that we're going to demo uh, is uh, something I've called "There's Something Wrong with DAC," um, and the name uh, comes from using a dark rum, uh, specifically the Ron Zacapa uh, 23. So uh, Ron Zacapa is uh, from Guatemala, uh, and it is a uh, 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 the 23 represents 23 years. The interesting thing with rums uh, is that unlike, uh, say, a scotch where the age, uh, you know, is the age of the youngest component, the, for a rum, it's actually the oldest component. And so the, the rum actually contains uh, rum that's been aged anywhere from 6 to 23 years. It must contain some portion that's at 23 mm -hmm. years. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, kind of an interesting thing about aged rums. Um, obviously, th this uh, rum is actually really tasty to sip neat, um, and um, you know uh, I would definitely you know if you do try this rum out, enjoy try try tasting it neat. But it also uh, can mix quite well. Uh, it will it does give a kind of a richer uh, and uh, deeper and a little bit sweeter uh, presentation uh, than the the white rum. Uh, would provide in this drink. Yeah, we typically don't mix this one and drink it neat or on the rocks because yeah. it's got such a rich flavor on its own. But I think it actually, with you know, with this drink, uh, I, I'm actually pretty pleased with how this particular drink uh, turns out. Uh, so um, the other thing that we're going to introduce uh, it is we're gonna mix. We're gonna take the sugar and mix in. Uh, take some of the sugar out and instead mix in uh, green chartreuse. So uh, green chartreuse um, is a wonderful uh, herbaceous liqueur uh, that is made by monks uh, in, in France near Gr Grenoble. It's made in only one place. They have a uh, 
a formula that dates back to the 1600s, um, although the monks themselves have started producing it in sometime in like around 17, 1737, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so uh, this has been produced by monks continuously uh, since that time. It's, uh, it's, it's sweet, uh, and then it follows that sweetness with a lot of uh, big herbal uh, and some pungency from the, from the herbal elements. Uh, and so we're going to kind of uh, draw some of that out with some of the garnish that we bring in, which I think um, is actually a really nice uh, uh, complement to, to these two. Uh, the lime, of course, is there for the tartness and sort of the, uh, you know, the hark to the, to the daiquiri. Uh, and then uh, we are going to introduce a little bit of simple syrup. And for this one, I've used just a small amount, but I've used two for one simple syrup um, so, so that it packs a little bit more punch. If, so here is the recipe that I'm going to be working through. Um, and so you can see just a teaspoon of that simple syrup because the, the rum itself and the green chartreuse both have a certain amount of sweetness with them. Um, if you're using two for one, uh, one for one simple syrup at home, uh, you might just go with a teaspoon, uh, sorry, two teaspoons uh, to bump up the sugar content a little bit. Um, but again, you know, you may want to play with, play with that uh, as you experiment. Um, so we'll start putting the cocktail together. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll start by putting our ingredients into the shaker. Uh, oh, where did my measuring cups right go? Yeah. So we'll put in the rum. So four ounces, because I'm making two cocktails here. That is, should be the one, yes. You can give it a little taste if you like. And then, uh, okay. Then there's a different one. Oh, we'll have to find the right simple syrup. <laughs> There are four in there, but <laughs> we've got a growing collection of simple syrups. Let me see. Nope. Oh yeah, this is it. All right. So just two teaspoons of that. And then of course, our fresh lime. So we'll be squeezing our fresh lime with our little squeezer to get our ounce of fresh lime. I can do that if you'd like to. Sure, and if you wanna, um, you could strain out the pulp as you measure it in here to get an ounce, which is half of this. Put that in there. Okay. So, um, the next thing that we're going to do once we have all the ingredients together is shake. Um, had a, some discussion about shaking uh, and dilution uh, with a friend online uh, and spent a little time actually doing some, uh, doing some experimentation. Um, so one of the things about uh, shaking is a lot of prof when you look at a professional, they're uh, generally talk about shaking somewhere between 12 and 15 seconds. Um, and there's, de there's been even some like fairly uh, deep study of this that sort of you hit some diminishing returns at that point, both in terms of the cooling and the, and the dilution. Um, the, the thing is that those folks are generally working with bar ice uh, and that bar ice has generally been kept closer to zero degrees Fahrenheit um, and might even have been sitting out in a bowl outside of that bar ice freezer. Uh, and so it's often a lot wetter uh, and not as cold as the ice that you get out of your freezer. Uh, and so, you know, for the home mixologist who's often taking the ice out of their freezer, you know, you need to think a little bit about uh, how to get the right level of dilution. And so I did some experimentation uh, to try and, and figure out how long I needed to shake. Um, and, you know, what I found was that it cools off very quickly. I mean, the ice is a lot colder 
um, but you actually need to shake uh, significantly longer than the 15 seconds sort of professional recommendation uh, when you're working with ice out of your freezer. Uh, and so for this drink, you know, I, all of my recommendations are generally for taking the ice out of the freezer because I'm expecting that these are sort of you're a home you know, enthusiast like myself rather than working in a professional environment. Uh, and so, um, you know, I'm going to do that. Uh, you can go ahead and pour the pour lemon. all of it in? The it's lime a little... Yeah, most, yeah, I think that's fine. Okay. How much of the sugar? Did you put that in already? I already put the sugar in. We're all set other than this. Great. All right. So we will shake. Just put a little more ice in. All right. So my recommendation is shaking for 30 or 40, 30 to 40 seconds on this one. Um, you know, I found that that gave about the right level of dilution. It's a three ounce cocktail to start off with, and you generally want to end up with about four ounces. Nicole's gotten out our chilled Nick and Nora glasses, um, which hold roughly four and a half ounces, or four and a half to five ounces. And so these should be pretty full when we are done shaking. You can see it's pretty frozen. It should almost be painfully cold to hold by the time we're done. I think that's been a, about 40 seconds. So now we will pour our double cocktail. Strain, double strain, double strain, thank you double strain as it is a shaken cocktail with citrus in it, just to make sure we get out as much of the, let's switch over to the other one now. And then we'll switch back for some more of the, because it was a little bit more dilute at the end. Okay. There it is, okay, come back over. Just to fill it up. Yep. Okay. All right. So there we have our glass almost completely full, thanks to the dilution. And then the final touches are the garnish here. Um, and uh, I think I'm using whole nutmeg and I'm doing a little bit of grating. Just getting a little bit of nutmeg on top which pairs nicely with the zacapa. And then we're going to float star anise on the top of the drink. And there is the final product, a little hard to show it, but you take a nice sip, of, uh, a nice uh, sniff of it, you'll get the star anise and also some uh, of the nutmeg, and then cheers. Should be quite an enjoyable drink. Mm. That's good. Mm. This is a very well-balanced cocktail. Chad did a great job researching this and putting this together. I know you're quite proud of it. Yeah, no, this is uh, definitely one of my better creations. So um, I hope that you follow along at, uh, at home and give it a try at some point, uh, or at least have a wonderfully enjoyable daiquiri uh, in your hand now. Um, cheers. We'll drink a little more and get a little more interesting. <laughs> so cheers, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.